Hello and welcome to this CBT Nuggets micro nugget entitled Failover Clustering in Windows Server 2012. My name is Tim Warner. Failover clustering is Microsoft's implementation of the failover clustering method for providing high availability in applications and services. Microsoft actually made a number of tremendous improvements to their failover clustering stack in Windows Server 2012. Before I show you that, let's just make sure we understand what failover clustering is. In failover clustering, you have physical servers kitted about as close to identically as you can get called nodes that are all attached to some form of shared disk storage. This could be iSCSI, it could be Fiber Channel. In addition, each node in a traditional active passive cluster has the capability of hosting a particular workload. This could be an installation of SQL Server, it could be a highly available file share, it could be one or more Hyper-V virtual machines. The bottom line is, we want to ensure that the loss of one or more or nodes still keeps at least one node up that can host whatever highly available resource there is and provide services to our users. The way this works is clustering will abstract that highly available service and present a virtual IP address and virtual DNS host name to your users and applications. So with SQL Server example, for instance, your end user application might have one connection string to SQL 1 at 10.0.0.99. But in point of fact, those queries and those long running processes with SQL Server are actually handled by a single box within the cluster that's designated active for that role. And in turn, the actual database and transaction log files are stored in this central shared location, such that if we need to administratively take this node down or if it suffers a failure, we can have seamless and transparent failover to another node. When node 2 in this example comes back online, we can fail back the role, and meanwhile the end user application has no knowledge or cares not a whit that any failure occurred because it's seamless to them. Now there's a lot to discuss with Microsoft Windows Server Failover Clustering, far more than we can cover in a 5, 6, 7 minute micro nugget. Therefore I want to draw your attention to my full training series for Microsoft Certification Exam 70-412 on configuring advanced services in Windows Server 2012. Here I'm going to give you the highest level overview. Let me open up the Failover Cluster Manager Microsoft Management Console and this shows that I do in fact have a cluster built. There are like I said, several prerequisite steps. You have to configure shared networking, you have to configure shared storage, and get all that stuff on its feet before getting to the point where you're ready to deploy a 2 to 64 node failover cluster. The failover cluster manager in Windows Server 2012 is the main GUI tool for creating and administering clusters. However, in Windows Server 2012, we have incredible PowerShell support. As you see, if I run get command for the failover clusters module, and you can see by scrolling here that we have many, many commandlets that enable us to administer just about every conceivable option in terms of creating, monitoring, and maintaining a failover cluster. Now, the nodes in the failover cluster manager, well, I mean nodes in terms of our console tree nodes, represent the following. First, we have roles. This represents the highly available apps and services that you can put in a cluster. If we right-click that guy and go to configure role, we can see that out of the box, the high availability wizard enables us to do highly available DHCP, file services, Hyper-V, message queuing, and of course you always have the option to make another non-listed service or application highly available. By means of historical footnote, I find it interesting that we can make Wins server highly available, and you'll find still, even now in 2013, references to NetBIOS. I find it kind of a head scratcher myself, but then again nobody asked me my opinion. <laughs> the nodes node is where we can add nodes. Simple as that. A node, like I said, is a resource, a server resource in the cluster that can host one or more highly available roles. In this case, my box HV Nugget 2 is hosting a highly available file share. This is a new feature called Scale Out File Server. Again, 
I cover this fully in the main CBT Nuggets title. HV Nugget 3 doesn't host any roles. Now, if we were to stop HV Nugget 2, what do you think would happen to this service? Well, let's try. We'll right click. I'm going to stop the cluster service, confirm that I want to do it, and in just a matter of seconds, we've downed HV Nugget 2, perhaps for administration or maintenance, and we see that the SOFS, my highly available file share, is running and just fine, no interruptions at all. That is, in a nutshell, what's up with failover. And if, if we want to move the resource back to HV Nugget 2, of course, we'll need to bring HV Nugget 2 online again. Let me start the cluster service. And then if we right click the resource, move, select node, make sure we have the target node selected, and it's moved. Again, all this is live movement, and with virtual machines, it's called live migration. You can have your VMs up, running, and in use when you shift them to a node, either administratively or, like I said, in a true failover. We have lots of flexibility with disks. In particular, we have expanded usage of the cluster's shared volume. In fact, the scale-out file server relies upon CSV. CSVs are also useful when you're doing highly available virtual machines. You can migrate virtual machines machines independently. All of them can reside on the same LUN or logical unit number and you can move them around or migrate them independently. We have support for storage pools and SAS disks. There's actually quite a bit of flexibility in failover clustering as far as what you're doing with disks. I've mentioned Hyper-V and virtual machines a lot. There happens to be a tremendous amount of interplay between failover clustering and Hyper-V for obvious reasons. If you were to lose a Hyper-V server, you're not just losing that server, but if you're hosting a dozen virtual servers on that Hyper-V host, you could have a catastrophic outage in one fell swoop. You typically have more than one network interface card on each failover cluster node, one for internal heart beat messages, another for your storage LAN, and a third for your user LAN to which your users are connected. You can drill in and take a look at those connections and their status here, and then cluster events retrieves from our event log only those events that are pertinent to a cluster configuration. I hope I whet your appetite. There's a lot here. Failover clustering has never been easier to set up, or with iSCSI, it's never been cheaper or more affordable to set up than it is now in Windows Server 20. 12. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.